Jason, that was terrific. Um, I think the way to start this, I, I could, I'm sure it's true for all of you, an awful lot of questions come to mind, but why don't we start this way? Since we have one of the countries and maybe the world's most distinguished economists with us, with Alan, why don't we just ask Alan more broadly what comments you'd like to make or observations uh, that relate to Jason's okay. remarks or anything else that strikes you in this area? Yeah, sure will. Happy to. Uh, and why didn't I get into Princeton? <laughs> now, uh, I, was, I was too young at the time to have had anything to do with that. Uh, oh, which brings me exactly to the first reaction I wanted to make. You, many people in this audience will know that the word distinguished is a euphemism for elderly. Uh, <laughs> but not old enough to have had anything to do with your admission. Um, I, I, I'm going to pose a few questions and make a few observations. But first, I just want to start by praising Jason, or really other, or, and also other members of the CEA who worked on this uh, report. It's a very nice job, very nice piece of high quality, highly applied macroeconomic research on a contemporary issue. This is not the sort of work that you see done in the academy. Um, and I think there are good reasons for that. If you pose questions such as the one Jason was addressing to academics, uh, you'll get a, several reactions, which I think are correct but not very helpful to uh, policymakers. One is that we need more data to sort this out, uh, <laughs> which is true. Uh, we need the data to settle down because things do bounce around a little. That's related to the more data. And thirdly, Look, there are always residuals from a econometric uh, relationship, and we can't spend our lives explaining every uh, residual. That's why I want, is the picture up there? Yeah. That's the first of several uses to which I want to put my one visual aid, which was Jason's decomposition. Uh, if you're instead sitting anywhere near the White House, this residual that you see at the very end of the uh, diagram is, one per is about one percentage point on the participation rate. That's a big deal. That's a very, very big deal. And from a policy making point of view, policy making in real time, it doesn't really do to say, well, there are always residuals, uh, or we need more data, or anything like that. And I think uh, this report comes very, very close to the best job you can do of coping with squaring that circle with very good, very well thought out um, uh, 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 statistical approaches to trying to make the best you can out of this. That said, I want to come back to the, uh, in a minute, to the uh, unexplained 1%. Uh, but first, I just want to. Uh, I won't take too long, but I want to put this in a slightly broader uh, context, which Jason sort of touched on, or more than touched on. <clears throat> there is a huge and consequential debate going on right now about how tight the U.S. labor market is. One very simple way to put it is, but it's not the only way to put it, is, is the 6.1 percent headline rate misleading? That is, are things not as good as that? Uh, uh, as that uh, number, that single number uh, suggests. One piece of that, moving down, is from the broad to the narrow, is the behavior of the labor force participation rate. That is, if there were more people participating, would we therefore see a higher unemployment rate and therefore, in some sense, the real uh, unemployment rate is higher than 6.1, whatever real in this uh, context means. The other piece, and so that's what this paper is about, and then I want to say about one more sentence about that, and then we can come back to this other issue if anybody wants to. The other huge factor in thinking about that, well, maybe there are more, but to me, the two huge factors are the behavior of labor force participation, and secondly, the behavior of productivity. What Jason didn't mention 
is that during this surge in job creation, and it has been kind of a, I guess I shouldn't use the word surge in, a, <laughs> in this building. <laughs> this, um, <laughs> I'm stuck on surge here. This acceleration of, uh, of uh, job creation is uh, significant and uh, a very piece of uh, and a piece of very good news. The last I like to look at these things in quarters. The last quarter uh, payroll employment has averaged 272,000 per month over the quarter. Over the previous six quarters, so I'm not just talking about a short period of time. It was averaging a little under 200. So this is a, a nice acceleration. But throughout this whole period, and this is my point. Productivity has just been awful. There's no other word. Productivity slowdown that started in 73 and ended in 95. Those are the, those are the two big ingredients in this uh, puzzle, and this effort by the CEA is aimed at the, uh, at the first. Last thing I want to say is to go back to my uh, visual aid. Can I actually walk up to the screen for this? I'm Mike, so I think the answer must be yes. <laughs> You're still hearing me, right? Yes. I uh, well, I'm not tall enough. <laughs> if, if you look up at the beginning of this uh, chart, what, and look at the, I'm, I'm going to focus on the black line. There are t so what this is showing you is that aging of the population and the business cycle, the crummy business cycle that we've experienced, should have been pulling down the uh, labor force participation rate. Uh, if you look at the black line, the actual, what you see is two very big downdrafts early. One right at the beginning, in looks like roughly the second half of 2009, and a second one that looks like roughly the second half of 2010. So if you think about so I'm now in the mode of what an academic doesn't do, like think about where the residuals came from. Why did we get such big uh, downdrafts in those two episodes? One is very early in the recession when both businesses and individuals were in the oh my god mode. Look what in the world is happening uh, to us. And the second was the, what I like to call the relapse that seemed to have started, you, if you can remember that far back, in the early part of 2010, things were looking very nice. And people were start, some optimism was starting to creep back in the uh, US economy. Then whatever happened, so Greece happened, that's what a lot of people attribute us to the Euro episode. But whatever happened, something happened, and the economy got a very sluggish again in 2010. That's what, that's those, those are the current events of those two episodes. And it makes me think, putting on more of a policy hat than an academic hat, and an academic hat, you just say, well, those are just residuals. Forget about it. It makes me think, it gives me the suspicion, I guess is the right way to put it, that there, that there may be more to the cyclical explanation the part of the explanation Jason was suggesting at the end is, yeah, it's cyclical, but abnormal cyclical because of the abnormal cycle uh, than this chart suggests. I mean, this chart is conservative in the sense it just calls it the residual. Uh, but it just made me think that maybe there's a little bit more to the cyclical uh, piece. And that's an optimistic reading because the cyclical piece is going to come back. Let me just stop there. You want to respond, Jason, or would you like me to raise another question? Uh, whatever you prefer. I prefer I raise another question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Alan, can I ask you one question before we get back to this, though? Because mm -hmm. I don't understand something. I, I didn't thought about it until you said it. But as you say, productivity is, is really very low now. Yeah. And yet profit margins are high. Because of what I do for a living, I deal with a lot of companies. They're very cost conscious. They think they're doing very well. Yeah. I don't understand how you reconcile that. Yeah. I've been thinking about this. A, a bit lately, not in a research way. I haven't done any serious research to back up anything. But I think, and I, I, I think, and I may start to try to do this uh, campaign, which will fail, uh, is we, we need a new word than productivity. Uh, let me explain. 
When you speak about productivity, it conjures up technology and how well is the business do working and are workers productive and the, do they have new, the best machinery and are they not playing video games on the job and things like that. Productivity. The word conjures that up and we've always used it that way. I think what we actually see in the productivity statistics, data from one quarter to the next, is the toing and froing of output growth versus employment growth. It is kind of the residual. I mean, it literally is the residual. That's how it's computed. So if you have a period in which firms are really economizing on labor and not hiring, but growing their, but their businesses are growing, productivity is going up. If you have a time when businesses turn around and say, we've really been uh, operating on a shoestring on labor and squeezing everything we can out of our labor and now we need to do hiring, productivity goes down. So I think the productivity statistics are really about that rather than how nifty the latest uh, uh, technological improvement is or the latest management craze or, uh, or anything like that. So that leaves me looking at the the recent period, and, but still scratching my head. So this must be a period in which w uh, uh, firms, having shed labor early on and, and then early in their recovery, said, let's just make more, create more output without adding to our workforces, are now coming back to the, to the previous, I don't know if it's an equilibrium, but moving back in the other direction. And, uh, hiring a lot of people relative to the increment in output. Uh, last thought on that. You may rem most people are forgotten, but you may remember that early on in this economic catastrophe, one of the miraculous things that we observed was how fantastically well productivity was doing. Yeah. But that, of course, is because businesses were hiring like, firing like mad. And so maybe this is just a payback. Uh, from that, but we don't really. Now, put my, back my academic hat. We're not going to know until we have more data. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and, and in particular, I mean, the productivity statistics are notoriously volatile. The latest number for the first quarter is minus three. That's likely to be revised down. I remember, as you just said, in 2009, there was one quarter when we had 8% productivity growth. You right. know, if you'd extrapolated that forward for the next 70 years, um, you would have solved a lot of problems. Um, part of the problem with productivity is you have a numerator that has a bunch of errors in it, which is basically GDP. You have a denominator, which has a bunch of errors in it, which is basically hours. And then you divide those two, and you basically multiply um, both of those errors. In um, the economic report of the president, when we show productivity trends, we tend to show them over very long periods of time. I mean, 15 years is almost the finest grained resolution you feel you can get um, on this number. If you look over 15 years, it looks like we're still in the new economy increase in productivity, not where we were in the 50s and 60s, um, but above the 70s and 80s. And we've tried to do statistical techniques to adjust for the normal business cycle effects, and we basically can't reject the hypothesis that productivity has continued at its same rate. In other words, we don't find a strong statistical basis for being confident you know, that productivity growth has fallen. So I think the best evidence leads me to be a little bit less nervous than some others are out there. Um, but there's no doubt Alan is right that uh, you know, more data and more time is needed because this is something that is very hard to measure on the time scale um, that we'd like to measure it on. Um, and that's especially frustrating because it's the single most important aspect of you know, determining overall economic growth. Let me ask you another measurement question. I really want to get to technology and its effect looking forward. But before we get to that, one of you mentioned, I don't remember which one it was, that there's a good bit of controversy about how much slack there is now in the labor markets. And however you all each think of this, how long do you think it's going to take us to get back to the point where that slack, is, however you measure the slack, is fully absorbed, and we have what you would call a real full employment economy. And, and taking into account the rates of growth, the rate of growth of the labor force, or, or not labor, potential labor force, and anything else you want to consider. I assume you wanted Alan to stick his neck out with a date. Uh, no, I, I want you to offer you the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> let, let, me, let me just elaborate very slightly. There's a tremendous debate going on now, now both inside the government and outside the government, 
over how much slack. Just the question you asked. One poll of that debate actually is answering zero that were there. Uh, if you look, for example, the, the piece of evidence uh, in, on that side of the debate that Jason showed was that the short-term unemployment rate is now back to where it was before the recession. I think the exact number you had it was a little bit better, but you know, basically back to, uh, to where it was. And by inference, that means that the 6.1% unemployment rate is now the natural rate, the full employment, uh, unemployment rate. Um, I don't buy that. Some people do. I, I just want to say some people do buy that. And that takes into account, Alan, the marginally, atta marginally attached, the discouraged workers, that whole thing? Well... Because that was my question, for full employment, and, you know, in the, in the full sense of that word. Sort of. What one of Jason's tables showed that these various... The, the BLS calls the official unemployment rate U3. And then Jason showed U4, 5, 6. And within some tolerance, they match up pretty well. That is, if you look at what's going weird in labor force uh, in various um, measures of labor force slack, it's the, it's the participation rate, the EPOP, and things like that. It's the long-term unemployment rate. But it's not in that conjuries of U3, 4, 5, 6, maybe a little on 6. But those relationships look pretty normal one to the... Uh, one to the other. It's much more the it's much more the question of how much of this labor force participation behavior that we're seeing is permanent and the long term unemployment rate being so very, very high, which I suspect, as Jason suggested, are probably linked uh, to one another. So how long did you how long did you say on? So if so <laughs> if so if you ask me to stick my neck out so I can do that. Uh, uh, my current estimate of the NERU, so the natural rate, is not um, six, but more like five and a quarter to five and a half, something in that range. Now, how long will it take us to get there? Well, lately we're dropping pretty fast. But that's, but, and you're talking about the un getting the, un I'm sorry, the, the so called residual, getting them back in to the extent that they're sick. Some of it will come from that, and some of it will just come from job. Hopefully, a lot of it will come from job creation. We've had pretty strong. Job creation of late. Right. Um, you know, I mean, I, the same thing I said in my remarks, that we're now far into the recovery from the Great Recession, but not all the way there yet. Um, people can cherry pick whatever number they want. We sh I showed a large range of numbers, and they all told about that same story, which is it is a genuine labor market recovery. It's not just the official unemployment rate. It's also in the marginally attached, the um, discouraged workers in part time and ever across the board, but in none of those, with the one exception of the short term unemployment rate, um, are you all the way back yet? And so, um, you know, our unemployment rate is higher than where it should be. Um, more people need to be coming back into the workforce in terms of our participation rate. Um, some of those uh, marginally attached um, need to come back as well. So we have um, something to go. And I think if you look at the forecast we did in our mid-session review of the budget we put out last week that CBO did in their last budget forecast in, in January or February, the blue chip, all of them have growth elevated above potential for several years, reflecting the fact that the economy will be continuing to bring resources um, back into, into production that essentially aren't there today. So that number was what, Jay? Um, <laughs> You know, okay. our budget has a forecast, but, you know, our, the unemployment rate today is lower than where it was when we finished that budget forecast in June. So. We have a ways to go, and we don't really have too clear a idea that will take us to get well, there. Well, we know exactly what we need to do to get there. We know we need to do okay. infrastructure. We know, you know, mm -hmm. we know all the steps. Okay. Does the debate continue, by the way? I assume it does, about how much slack there is in the labor market. And Does it continue? Oh, yeah. absolutely. I mean, yeah. Okay. I think it's just uh, uh, begin. Jason's not allowed, allowed to talk about the Fed, but I, I am. <laughs> and uh, there's going to be a huge and loud debate inside the Federal Open Market Committee over exactly 
this question because it's tied so tightly to when does the Fed lift off the uh, short-term interest rate. So uh, you haven't even began to hear the noise that's going to be uh, in the media and elsewhere around exactly this question. Let me change tack. To well, let me know, I'll get one question first. If we're going to succeed as a country, it seems to me at least, we've got to deal with the question of poverty. We, in fact, the Hamilton Project did a poverty summit, uh, I don't know, three, four weeks ago, whatever it was, Karen, President Clinton was our keynote speaker. And that gets down to the unemployment. Well, one of the facets of that is the unemployment rate for young African-American males, which is really a distressing when you look at the numbers in, in your chart. Uh, you had it in your materials. I don't remember whether you put it up on the board or not, Jason. But can you comment on that briefly? And also, what, what is it that we as a society can do about people who grow up in the tremendous disadvantages that our society has created for, for these people? And it's not their fault. It's our fault. So what do we do about it? Um. Yeah, no, I mean, if you look at the employment rate, well, why not put it back on the screen? For young black men, um, oh. no, it went from 65% in 1950 to 37% in 2004 Q2. The denominator for that calculation is the non-institutional population. So. If you're um, exactly incarcerated, for example, you're not in the denominator. Um, so the number would look even worse. There's a reason why there's an old saying that the best anti-poverty program is a job. And you know, creating jobs is the most important thing. I think one important lesson of looking at this economic recovery, like the one before it, like the one before it, is when you are strengthening the overall economy, you are bringing the unemployment rate down for everyone and you're bringing it down at roughly the same pace. So the groups that, uh, disadvantaged groups get hurt the worst in a recession, they actually can benefit even more um, from an economic recovery that drives the unemployment rate down. So some of that is just the same economic strategies we wanna have, investing in infrastructure, strengthening our growth. Um, but there's no question that a lot of specific things are needed. Um, I think that um, expanding the childless EITC for non-custodial parents, um, we have a very generous EITC for families with children. We don't for people without children, and we don't for people who do have a lot of responsibilities for taking care of children. Um, they're just not living with them and eligible for that. So that could both you know, put more money in people's pockets, but also bring more people um, into the labor force. The EITC in the 1990s was a bigger factor, research shows, in bringing single mothers into the labor force than welfare reform was. And so I think this is one of, the, one of the big tools we have going forward. I think that sort of leads naturally into, uh, well, let me ask you one more question on that, Jason. Uh, aren't there just enormous numbers of issues, though, about getting to these kids when they're very, very young and helping, in whatever way we do this, equipping them for a modern economy and a modern society? Yeah. Oh, if you look at the fraction. Early intervention, in other words. Right, yeah, you look at the fraction of four-year-olds in America who are in school, we're 25th in the OECD. Um, you know, I think Mexico is well ahead of us. Um, when you look at that, that's why you know, we'd love to expand preschool. Um, that's why we were excited that we actually were able to secure some funding um, for that in the omnibus last year. And it was one of the real victories in that budget agreement. But there's you know, more we need to do. So there's a whole range of things that start there that go through um, you know, some of the improvements in training programs that help connect people to jobs the vice president's been working on. Um, you know, but a stronger economy, more jobs and infrastructure, for example, uh, you know, that would help too. Let me, let me uh, by the way, we're gonna extend this to 1230 to 1240, Karen instructed me, because we started 10 minutes late. <laughs> it, it, somewhere in early 2011, Michael Spence, Nobel laureate, wrote a, a piece for foreign affairs and his basic as I remember at least, his basic thesis was that the technology were increased, technological development is going on at a very rapid rate, whether exponential or not, I don't know, but very rapid. And a lot of that was labor displacing, not labor complementary. These are really questions. I'm saying there's a statement because that's what he wrote, but that sort of, sort of obviously has questions in it. And that that created tremendous challenges with respect to the displacement, well, to the elimination of many what had previously been considered middle income jobs and even lower income jobs where, where assembly lines, well, not in the way of assembly lines anymore, but the analog of assembly lines were being replaced, call centers being replaced by automated uh, voice recognition systems and so forth. I, 
I found myself, and then there's a book recently, I don't know if you all have read or not, called The Second Machine Age, which is sort of written by two people at MIT, which carries this, this point forward, and Michael has now written a piece with the authors of that book. What, how do we deal with all this? First of all, how much, how much, obviously technology is tremendous, plus in many ways, but it also has all of these as, other aspects to it. How do you all react to that? I think to a first approximation, you know, we have a couple hundred years of data, and a couple hundred years of data show enormous technological progress, tons and tons of inventions that replace things that humans used to do. And for most of those 200 years, about 95% of the people who wanted a job were able to find one. Um, so to a first approximation, you know, we keep thinking the next machine will replace people's jobs, um, and it doesn't. That's to a first approximation, and I'm glad we left that chart up there because you look, you know, we are talking about um, poverty. Poverty is a very serious issue. But you just look at prime age men, so we're just talking about, you know, the bulk of the male labor force, and that EPOP, and I don't have these numbers in my head, so I'll look, you know, went from 92 down to 83%. That happened over a 64 year period. Um, it was gradual, but technology probably is part of that story and what um, types of things technology was and wasn't complementing. I think understanding that decline and understanding what we can do about it um, and raise, you know, create jobs and raise wages, um, you know, not just at the bottom, um, but all the way across really is you know, maybe one of the economic problems and challenges we've, we've um, you know, we've talked less about, but one that, you know, again, a lot of the things we'd love to do and are no-brainers, low-hanging fruit like infrastructure um, would certainly be part of the answer to. Alan? I very much agree with uh, Jason. You know, the Luddites were wrong and then the <laughs> next were wrong. And uh, uh, If you gave me 15 minutes on Google, less, uh, I could bring you articles from the 1950s about how automation was going to make human effort obsolete and nobody would work anymore. Some of them were happy articles, like we'll have all this wonderful leisure, and some of them were sad articles, like people won't be able to earn a living. So to, to believe in, in a deep way, the um, uh, Brynjolfsson et al. theory, I've talked to Eric about this, he knows. You have to believe that we're now experiencing or on the verge of experiencing a sui generis historical event, not at all analogous to the things uh, that have happened in the past. I'm very skeptical uh, about that. It, it is technology is now and, uh, and always has been a job destroyer as well as a job creator. It changes. Uh, uh, we have a lot, of, uh, a lot of jobs that used to employ a lot of people decades ago barely exist now. And in return, we've got uh, all kinds of jobs that people in the 70s couldn't even have imagined uh, uh, training themselves. For. So there's a tremendous amount of churn. So maybe the right way to answer this, I think of the technology as more about churn. There's a tremendous amount of churn. When there is a tremendous amount of churn, uh, there's disruption. And people don't like disruption and it causes stress and, uh, and so on. But as Jason was saying, at least for the first um, 275 years of the Industrial Revolution, it has not led to mass unemployment. I hadn't looked at those first 75, you so I'm glad them, it was but true. Throw there, those too. in too, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I guess my question, and this will be my last question, then we're going to turn to everybody else. I, I guess my question didn't only go to the question of employment, employment, but also employment in what we used to think of as middle income jobs. You know, we're eliminating those. The people now only have lower income jobs left. So let me frame it that way, and then in that context also ask if you could very briefly comment on what you think has caused the tremendous increase in inequality, and, and basically the median, you know, inequality, you, you can look at it from the point of view of inequality, you can look at it from the point of view of median stagnant real wages, and I kind of tend to look at it the latter way, and how President Clinton looked at it, but those are two sort of, I think, very closely related questions. Right. I think the reason the Luddites were wrong 
is that um, for the most part, wages adjust in order to clear labor markets. So you do have that phenomenon of 95% of people who want a job can get one. Um, that doesn't tell you what wage they can get that job at and to the degree that technology, um, for most of the time, technology has actually expanded the pie and benefited everyone. Most inventions are complement, have historically been complements to a wide range of workers. The ones we've had lately have more complemented skills of workers um, at the top and have contributed to an increase in inequality. It's hard to explain that increase, though, without looking at you know, a bunch of norms and social changes which have allowed, especially at the very top, um, that inequality to grow. And you know, I think it very much, the ultimate test really is median household income or, or, or wages for the typical worker. Um, but it's hard to understand what's happened to those without understanding that all the productivity hasn't gone to those groups. The productivity has gone somewhere else. So in some sense, inequality in that um, you know, are, are flip sides of the same um, phenomenon. Alan? Uh, two things we know. There's lots we don't know. Two things we know. One is that for decades, what economists like to antiseptically call skilled bias technical progress has been a major factor holding down the wages of, no, I'm not quite sure we want to draw, let's say the lower 60% or lower 70% or uh, something like that. What that just means is the workforce needs to skill upward to keep up with the technology and as you were saying and Jason was saying, to some, in some important respects, we're not keeping pace. Uh, the, you know, if you looked at the, uh, Jason just mentioned, uh, Jason mentioned preschool. I didn't know that. We're 25th in the OECD. How many countries are in the OECD? About, well, Jill would know. 28? 34. 34. Oh, good. I thought you were going to say 27. <laughs> <laughs> but that's at the bottom. And also at the top, you know, we used to stand out as with the fraction that we sent to and through college, and we don't anymore. We're like middle of the pack. So, this we know, and there are things that can make that better, which we're not doing, but uh, a lot of them are not mysterious. The second thing we know is that over a shorter period, so that's gone on for decades, over a shorter period, I'm not, maybe I should call this period 15 years, I'm not sure I got that exactly right, I wasn't prepared for your question, but over a shorter, you gave but, me the questions in not, advance, you, what? Didn't, you didn't get them? In advance? No. No, because no. <laughs> no, nobody cares what I answer. <laughs> um, over a shorter but not trivial period, there's been a hollowing out or polarization in the, in the uh, rewards to work and the opportunities to work with these, this is what you were asking about, Bob. A lot of these middle income jobs that used to be available the quintessential example is working in a factory, but there are others that would uh, give the worker, one worker, uh, a, a, a decent standard of living, just holding that one job, even if your spouse wasn't working, and then if your spouse was, you were doing pretty well. A lot of those are disappearing in favor of bottom jobs, which are uh, being generated, and top jobs, which are pulling away dramatically from the rest. I mean, if you look at these data, and again, I, don't, I can't quite cite your numbers because I didn't, I can only retain something for about an hour and a half, and <laughs> I haven't looked at them in the last hour and a half. But if you look at wages at the upper, at the 99th percentile versus wages at the 50th percentile over the last couple of decades, it's just oh, dramatic yeah, it's tremendous. how the top has pulled away from the middle. And that is a very real phenomenon. It might be traced to technology, at least part of it is certainly traced to uh, technology, and is a very, very important component of the increase in inequality. Terrific. Why don't we now open it up to anybody who would like to uh, we'll start way in the back. Yes, sir. If you can make, say, say who you are, where you're from, and make your question brief so we can get as many questions in as possible. 
Uh, Hans Roger Vébé, the question is for Jason and also a question for uh, Professor Blinder. Uh, Jason, the question is pretty much on measurement. Uh, if I were to take you back you know, to the labor force decomposition uh, which you proposed. Could you uh, put the mic a little closer? To yes, you? of course, yes, I'm, I, I'm sorry. Uh, so Jason, what degree of confidence do you have on the measurement? And I'm somewhat curious because of the fact that, to quote Ken Rogoff, one of the lessons that we learned from the Great Recession is we don't really understand business cycles. So my question was, how did you manage you and uh, the uh, CEA to measure uh, at least you know, the uh, cyclical part in addition to um, the, uh, uh, the residual? And so the question is, what's the degree of confidence and how were you able to recalibrate you know, the model? And Professor Blinder, uh, to go back to the question that uh, you posed or the issue that you raised, what would then be the Fed's reaction function if there is no agreement on what level of, level of uh, slack is in the labor market. Thank you. So in economics, the real test is how a model does. It's really easy to fit a sample. If you have enough variables, you can fit it as well as you want to fit it. Um, the test is how something performs out of sample. Now, that's a hard test to do, because if you know what happened out of sample, you can actually do a ton of things in sample to get your best fit out of sample, um, which is why uh, you know, I'm placing a certain amount of weight on that 2006 Brookings study, because they did an entirely out of sample prediction. They weren't trying to make sense of what they did or didn't see. Um, and they really did expect that the participation rate would fall. Um, you know, in some sense, they were predicting it would have fallen even more had they known about the Great Recession, because it was all their stuff plus the cyclical they didn't have. Um, on top of it. So that certainly gives me um, a certain amount of confidence that um, there's an aging effect and that there's something potentially on top of that. In terms of our actual decomposition, the aging is a very straightforward computation. There's a couple different ways to do it, but they all get within, I don't know, about a tenth of each other. So that one I'm very confident in. The cyclical is um, quite plausible, you know, different ways of looking at it get you similar numbers, but, um, you know, could it be two tenths smaller, two tenths larger, something like that? Of course, you know, one, one could debate something of that magnitude. Um, and then we've talked a lot about the residual and, you know, the degree to which we have some theories that help fill in that picture, um, but don't have a definitive answer to it. Very briefly on your question, the Fed's reaction to large-scale uncertainty about how much slack is going to be a big fight. Uh, the leader of the Fed has stated many times, including just yesterday, I think yesterday, that in her view, there's a lot of slack still left in the U.S. labor market, and the Fed usually follows the leader. <laughs> oh, anybody? Gentleman in the, in the uh, orange shirt. Thank you. Larry Checo. Um, I think the last discussion that you had is going to Say brush. who you are and where you're from. Uh, Larry Checo, uh, Checo Communications. Um, what are the implications for the, uh, for the middle class, uh, long-term implications? We kind of jumped over the impact that the last recession has had. And despite, um, you know, notwithstanding with uh, labor participation and productivity, lots of people lost their homes. Uh, lots of people are underwater with their homes. Lots of people lost their jobs. Lots of people went through their savings. Um, how do we reconcile all of this if we don't get the strengthening of the economy and the wage increases that you said were two of your four points of moving forward? What's the long-term implication for the middle class? I guess that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, we are, you know, as I said, we're far into the recovery. We have, you know, we still have some way to go. Um, but, you know, when you know, President Obama ran for office in 2008, you know, he was in part motivated by the observation that over that last economic recovery from 2001 through 2007, um, a typical household didn't see its income rise. They saw it was flat. Um, and that's actually related to the issues I've been talking about. From 1970 to 2000, household income rose. It rose not because wages rose, it rose because more women were coming into the workforce. So more of those households had two earners rather than one. That progress in terms of the second earner uh, stopped you know, around 1999, and with it, that income growth stopped. So 
you know, to get back to the types of income growth we need, um, we're going to need to um, you know, do what we can to get more people uh, you know, into the labor force, more people working, and to make sure those jobs are better paid. And some of that is a cyclical recovery that we still need to run the course of. Um, but a bunch of that will be left you know, as a continuing challenge um, even after we have recovered. And if you look at a lot of you know, what we're trying to accomplish, it's you know, whether we're, in our, we're below our potential or at our potential, um, we still need a lot, you know, a lot more infrastructure to keep repeat, to, to repeat that one, um, you know, yet again. So I think a lot of the types of things we're looking at are where we're going. You know, <coughs> female labor force participation, you know, childless EITC, all of that um, is about where you're going after you're recovered and how you're dealing with not repeating the 2001 through 2007 experience in terms of family incomes and getting to something much better in terms of a trend line. Ooh, we got a lot of people. Oh, da, 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 da. let's see. The lady way, way in the back. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Vasu Reddy. I'm with the National Partnership for Women and Families. And I wanted to ask about the aging trend and other similar demographic trends um, and their effect not just on the, if you've looked at the effect not just on the workers who are being aged out of the workplace, but the younger workers who are responsible for care, who have caregiving responsibilities for those older workers and also often for, chil for their own children. Um, so I just wanted to know if, if that was anything that you had been able to measure, uh, that caregiving effect on labor for pop right. participation. Yeah, no, I mean, if you look, I think that's part of why those workplace flexibility policies are so important for labor force participation. We usually talk about that um, in terms of children, and um, and and you know paid leave when when uh, the birth of a child, but it also is increasingly, as you just said, um, caring for an older parent as well, and that's why, you know, it's it's a striking fact that you know you look around the world and ask what countries don't have paid leave, and it's the United States and Papua New Guinea. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> We'll have time for one more question. Oh, lordy, lordy. Yes, sir. Uh, I think you need to have a mic. So, uh, I'd like to like point to this chart. Again, who you are and where you're from. Uh, so I'm Wen Tao, I'm from Harvard. So uh, I'd like to point to this chart. As you can see, in 1950, uh, the young men uh, employment, employment uh, population ratio were low, but pretty like you know the same across different uh, ethnic groups. But in by right now, there's like an alarming uh, drop in the employment population ratio for young black men. And uh, I wonder like uh, what are like some of the explanations? Yeah, I mean they started. You know, young black men were higher. Uh, you know, in, in 1950, and and have fallen. Um, lower and you know I think a lot of that I think a lot some of the trends we've talked about in terms of inequality and wages um, and availability of jobs um, you know have played into that you know there's um, you know there's a large number of young black men that are in the ambit of the criminal justice system at any point in time and that has a lasting impact on employment in terms of discrimination later on um, in terms of being able to get hired, and you know, just a number of other you know, challenges, all of which um, you know, come together in terms of this group. And that's why, um, you know, with My Brother's Keeper, it's focused on everything from the very youngest ages, but there's a very strong mentorship component, um, you know, looking at successful um, programs like Becoming a Man in Chicago that, you know, Mayor Emanuel has expanded a lot in that city and the president has been very enthusiastic about. And so there's a lot of things we can do. It's not all government policy. A lot of it isn't. It's things businesses can do, individuals, um, mentors, but it's certainly not, you know, you don't solve a, a problem of that magnitude with, with one or two little changes. You know, I, I said before when I raised the same question you did that it, it's not their fault, it's our fault. It's a society that simply hasn't dealt with a problem that that society is responsible for, and I think it has a tremendous effect on all of us. 
Let me wind up just by thanking both of you. And I must add one reaction listening to both Jason and Alan. There's so many pro issues, and yet there's so many policies we could, so much we could do if we had a Congress that was willing to function. Even if people had very different views, if they were willing to compromise in some principled way to reach a point where they could go forward. And I think that really, uh, you have people, Jason, Allen, and, and so many others, who have so much they can contribute. We just need to have a functioning political system, by which I mean a functioning Congress, uh, to do what the nation needs to do. But thank you all very, very much. You're terrific.